not a fan of these podiums, to be honest with you, because I feel very formal right now. <laughs> I'm not a formal person. <laughs> but I guess at some point we have to be formal. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma allimna ma yinfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma. Allahumma allimna ma yinfa'na wa anfa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma. اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد الفاتح لما أغلق الخاتم لما سبق ناصر الحق بالحق والهدي إلى صراطك المستقيم صلى الله عليه وعلى آله حق قدره ومقداره العظيم أما بعد First of all, I really enjoyed uh, the intellectual feast, the appetizer. From Sheikh Shams, uh, and then it was really an intellectual feast from Imam Abu Aliya. Uh, I want now to take to go from the realm of intellectual uh, diagnosis because that's what it was. You have to have a diagnosis, and I think that what uh, Imam Abu Aliya did is give us a diagnosis of the problem that we're in, and now. I want to shift to a target and a game plan. And this is, you'll be surprised, a very ambitious target. Something that we have in common with, this, with, with the Prophet's guidance and the Prophet's situation. We have a lot more than you can imagine. Well, anytime that I used to read the seerah, I bet, I'm sure all of you had the same sentiment in your mind. You used to read the seerah, you used to say, hold on, we're like the Muslims in Mecca. We're a small group in a large population of non-believers. We're just like them. Right. So much so that there was even a man who was a little bit crazy. And he was one of those types that really won't fit in any bubble. But he used to say, because we're like the Muslims of Mecca, I don't apply any hukum of law that came down after the Hijrah. That's for Muslim countries. Of course, that's like a you know, uh, crazy, loony idea. But we are just like the Muslims in Mecca. The only difference is that most of us, I would say 95% of Muslims, 90% maybe in England, in America, it's maybe 80 or 75% are not from the people. We can't say that our, grandpa our grandparents fought in the Civil War, or the Korean War, the Vietnam War much less the Revolutionary War, like we're transplanted. So that's a little bit different. But in essence, the Muslims in the West are very much similar to the Meccan period. And what was the goal of the, that first prophetic generation of Sahaba? What was their goal? Their goal was to transform, to transform their peninsula. That was the goal. And it was a massive goal given that period of time and those resources relative to the size of the peninsula. We have no less of a goal that here we are, we came here, let's compete against ourselves in a hundred years, what will be the status of these lands? Will they just be filled with apostated, in-name only Muslims? Will we have just altered the pigmentation of the land? of the populace? Is that all we brought forth? Will we have just, will our legacy after a hundred years just be food that we brought over? Or will we have actually transformed the land and brought Iman into the country? That goes for America, it goes for England, it goes for France, Germany, all these lands. We have a great opportunity. We have a measuring stick. It could be, it's going to be very clear what's happened in a span of 100 years. I have this book here on Sheikh Yusuf Motala's biography. He started the first Dar Ulum in, a West, in an English-speaking country. He died only a few years ago. I imagine himself, I imagine he's thinking at some point, near the end of his life, we started with one, there's now over 100. Between England and America and all these countries. So 
we have something very similar in common to the Prophet Sallallahu era. We're lucky we have that. I always ask myself, if we were living in Egypt or in Tunisia or in any of these other countries, what would, what would our goal be? The whole country is already Muslim. What will the goal be? It's not easy to have a target to say, where were we and where are we now? But it's very easy for us to say that. So that's what we have in common. Now, what is our target? Our target, and I believe, with evidence and reason to believe, that within a few decades, three or four or five decades, the Muslim communities, in general, the Muslims, will be viewed as a saving population, a population that saved the West from itself, and a population that people will enter into our faith, into this deen, into our ways of being, into the way of Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it will become almost, I don't want to say fashionable, but a trend. That's what I believe. And I'll tell you why I believe that. I don't believe that for fanciful reasons. And it, the reason I believe that ties right into our game plan. How can we, as individuals, look out at an entire civilization, entire nations, and think in the modern times with billions of people on the planet that we can have an influence? So with that, I want to ask you to visualize a beach and the sand of the beach. Visualize the amount of water that's on the earth and how much it rains every year. Visualize a storm of rain that drenches everything. Visualize a building, let's say, what's the popular building here in England? Whatever it is, visualize a building, a beautiful construction. Visualize a bodybuilder, a scholar, anything that is a great achievement or a big creation of Allah. Just visualize it. Because Allah Ta'ala commands us to examine the creation, be it the accomplishments of man or the physical creation of the world. Now, let's go to the beach. A gorgeous beach. Well, what is it composed of? And how did it get that way? It's composed of little granular pieces. The entire gorgeous beach is composed of millions upon millions upon millions and who knows how many billions of pieces of grain, and all, what is grains of sand. And don't we have so many in our afkar that Allah knows the number of leaves on the tree and knows the number of grains of sand? Okay. It's actually a phrase for us to think about. He knows how many millions. So when there was a beach, was there, how did it form? First, we know it was rock, and then it was hit by waves. Was there one wave that made the beach? Was there one epic wave that eroded the beach? Was there one day, was there one month where this thing became a beach? Or did it become a beach over a mind-numbingly repetitive, seemingly insignificant number of bangs of water against, the sand, against rock? The waves are not that strong. We stand in front of them all day. We get hit by waves. When we go out to the beach, nothing happens. So each bang of a wave on the rock really seems extremely insignificant. How many times have we looked around at these big discussions, Islam in England, Islam in the West, and you feel insignificant? But this is the whole point. The whole point. All creation, every single khalq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is a major creation, or every single achievement of human beings is a compounding of grains. The beach is a compounding of millions upon millions of mind-numbingly, seemingly insignificant hits of the water on the rock. And the whole beach is composed of millions upon millions upon millions of little grains of sand. Each one of us, every single day we live, we are that one grain of sand. Let's go to a bodybuilder. No bodybuilder becomes a bodybuilder because of a big moment. Every single bodybuilder at some point in time could not do 10 push-ups in a row. Every single one. Think about this. Every single bodybuilder we know, that, that exists on the face of the earth 
There was a period of time he could not do 10, 20, 15 push-ups in a row. So how did he become a bodybuilder? Each repetition, the amount of hundreds of thousands upon millions of repetitions, of lifts, of runs, of exertions. That's what made a bodybuilder. Allah is sending us a message. That's why there was one thing that I have to almost, it hit my head, it hit my mind, what Sheikh Abu Adiyah said. He said that in his diagnosis of modernity, he said, yes, the sunnah, though, tells us how to do little things. This was a big problem for me when I was young. When I came up, I looked at the philosophers and thought to myself, uh, we got it. This is our competition. The atheists are our competition. I began reading every single philosophy book in school. Then I said, all right, let's look for the answer in Islam. Open Sahih Bukhari. Clip your nails like this. Make sure you get your heels in wudu. Obey your parents. So where is the answer to this philosophy? How are we the winning party? How are we defeating these people? Right? How is it that... And, but in reality... When I look around, where's the philosophy club? Like three people show up. Go to the masjid, 3,000 people show up. And I'm thinking to myself, how, where is the secret, the mystical secrets, the philosophical responses to these philosophies? I don't see it, but I do see the victory. I go around all through the world. The Muslim population is massive. These philosophers have no followers. But in my world, this is intimidating stuff. Do you ever read a philosopher named Davidson? This guy has volumes. He'd open his books and my mind would get a headache. And he'd send you just to get through a passage of what he's saying. I was very intimidated by this. Until I finally started to shift. And I want everyone to shift. That the victory that we're, the target that we're trying to aim for, the victory that we're going to have, does not need those high polluting ideas. The victory that we're going to go for, that we're going to attain, is by granular actions by every single one of us, every single day. That's going to compound upon itself. You cannot have a population that saves a civilization, except that that population, every single atom in it is healthy. The atoms, the cells, that's me and you and every day and every moment. At the moment I enter the bathroom at night, I have a sunnah. At 3 a.m. when my eyes are half shut, I have a sunnah. When I clip my nails every Friday, that's a sunnah. So now what's gonna happen? When time comes for a big issue that I could lose my life for, I could lose my job for, it's gonna happen. You're gonna be told one day, sell khamr. Market khamr, advertise khamr. You're gonna to be told one day, perform a transgender surgery. If you hadn't taken those little steps every single day of your life, you wouldn't be able to answer the big question. You wouldn't be able to make that huge sacrifice. Who remembers, a couple of months back, a little Indian girl, 15 years old, skinny, little girl, marched with her hijab to school, in the face of about 15, 20 big Indian guys, Hindu dudes, yelling at her, mocking her, screaming at her face, she walked right by them. Where did that come from? That came from that girl, every single day in her life, she has little choices. This is Allah put her on display at that big moment. But what is that big moment made out of? Every day in that little girl's life, she had the choices to make. And more often than not, we're not going to be 100%, but more often than not, 60, 70, 80% of the time, she chose the path of tawbah, the hard path over the easy path. Say, Nani was asked, what is the best deed? He said, the one you don't want to do, because it has the most impact. Every day, she had a choice. Sleep in, pray fetch. Memorize, review, watch TV. She has hard choice, easy choice. Hard choice, easy choice. Path of Allah, path of nafs. Path of Allah, path of culture. Path of Allah, path of shaitan. And she kept choosing. More often than not, she chose the path of Allah. So when the big moment came, she had plenty of reserves. She had plenty of reserves. Allah saw all that, put her on display for the whole world. And she gave confidence to people 
for a period of time until her story maybe was forgotten, but she gave confidence to people. What is Allah putting on display? Millions upon little choices that she made that compiled up to the big moment. That's how it works. That's how it works. Let me tell you a story about myself. One of the worst times and one of the best times. Growing up playing soccer, my dad told me to play soccer from one, so I started walking. This is a cultural thing. In Egypt, we play soccer. So, football. <laughs> from a little time, then he got me, we, we had an Italian coach. An Italian coach who was obsessed with soccer. He saw that I had skill, he gave me special attention. All throughout my childhood, these American kids, they don't know how to play the sport. They don't know the sport. I don't even know what they're doing there. Oh, whizzed through the whole, uh, the whole uh, team and put it in. Rip, 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 every day, every game. Whizzed through everybody and put it in. Came time now, the kids actually starting to get better. The competition's getting better. But my memory of myself was that I'm, I cream everybody. All the time, I zip through everyone and score. So, during practice, I said to myself, I'm gonna save my energy. I'm not gonna go all out in practice. All right, I'm gonna save my energy. Well, I did this the whole year. Save my energy, I'm not gonna go all out. I don't wanna go all out. I'm not gonna die for loose balls, fight for anything, like the, uh, the what the, we call it a prima donna, someone who the table has to be set for him, for him to put it in. We came for a tournament, we got in the tournament, and we're down by a couple of goals, and the clock is ticking, and I can't believe I never lost before. And then inside myself, I kept saying to myself, turn it on. Turn on the motor. Turn on the engine. Engine didn't turn on the whole game. I couldn't realize I never turned it on in practice. You can't suddenly turn it on in the game. We lost, right? I was like, why, why can't I try hard? Because every time there was a time in practice, a choice, try hard or let someone else do the work and wait for the ball. I wait for the ball. So when it came time for the big one, there was no reserves. Now the opposite happened. I started playing another sport of hockey. And in that sport, got injured, missed two years, came back, was all the way in the bottom with a team, a nobody, no, no name, nobody team. I was just happy to play. Ice time is something that's uh, rare. It's hard to get ice time. It's not like soccer, you can play soccer anywhere, any field. Uh, getting on the ice with the nets and the bucks is rare. I was like, I knew we were gonna sink. Let me just enjoy practice. And I worked. I played practice for fun. I played it as if it's the game because I knew we were going to get creamed every Sunday. And we did get creamed a lot of Sundays. But at some point in time, we started turning it around. We started turning it around and realized, and started to defeat teams and started to win and we accomplished something. The reason was we practiced so hard. So teams that didn't expect us to do anything were shocked how hard we were working. So point B, our action plan is to understand how success works. Success doesn't work by master plans. Change, epic change does not happen by one big event. Epic change happens because of an accumulation of hundreds of thousands, of millions upon millions of little choices that our entire population is gonna make. When people say, what should we do about Islam in England? I say, practice Islam as best as you can. Every single day. Day in, day out. Don't cut corners. If you skip a sunnah, you may feel the one time is not a big deal. That's the problem. Because it's not a big deal. But it's so easy to fall into the bad work ethic. At every time, anytime you see someone win a strike, uh, or on a big moment, drop the ball. Like, how did you drop the ball on this? Sometimes you see someone, how this simple thing, huge, basic of Islam, and you drop the ball. They never dropped the ball that one time. That is an accumulation of a million drop balls. A million times that person skipped the sunnah, cut corners with the deen, okay, rushed us a lot, 
They didn't look. One person said, Allah, Sheikh in India. He had one disciple. He's extremely successful. Another disciple seemed to have all the factors in him, but he had no, his spirituality was like in a rut. What is the difference between the two? One of them, at any little turn, he lowers the gaze. Anytime that there is possibly he could see somebody and look at them, he doesn't. The other, he does. And he says, you know, it's the first look. They're in the peripheral. I was looking that way anyway. Do you know how many times a day that happens? In our countries, this is India. Imagine now England or America, where people don't dress appropriately. Or now with the phones. Do you know how many times a day this decision comes up? And then when the big mess ever comes, why did I drop the ball? Because you've been dropping little marbles. Every day you drop five, ten marbles. Yeah. Now when it comes for the big boulder, you don't have the muscle power anymore. That's how we're going to change. Because we have a deen that preserves the family and preserves the intellect, preserves the heart. We have that. It's all in place. All we have to do is keep it in place. And I'm telling you, the soon to be, the reputation of Muslims is shifting from the people who are terrorists. You ever wonder where the terrorists all went? <laughs> out of business or what? <laughs> What's going on? Right? We went from that, I guarantee you, our reputation going forward. We are going to be the people who said no to the dehumanization that's happening. Dehumanization is happening at every level. Empty hearts. Uh, absolutely. When you're so empty, you need such more and more to fill your void. More sex, more zina, more drugs. Now that doesn't even satisfy me anymore. Now I need to warp myself up and look like a complete freak in order to feel good. You're destroying the human being. We have a very simple religion that is preserving what it means to be a human being. We have families are preserved. How is it, how are marriages preserved in Islam? From a million lowering the gazes. That's where it's preserved from. Not preserved by some magic. It's preserved from a guy, how does he keep his family together? Because the guy lowers his gaze about a million times a week. The woman won't even enter khalwa with another man. That's why the marriage is preserved. How many times she has a chance to commit khalwa? How many times there's a chance for a man to do khalwa? That's how it's preserved. Why? Your kids are so good, they took care of you when you're old. People see that in the cul-de-sacs, in the, in, the, in the neighborhoods. They see the Muslims taking care of their parents when they're old. Why? From billions of times your parents called you, you answer. They talk to you, you respect. You talk to them, you lower your voice. How many times do you do that in your life? Billions. So now when one of them has a stroke, it's a no-brainer. We move the furniture out of the house and we put her in the house. That's what you do. How did you come to do that? Oh, because of a teaching. Yes, the teaching of the little things that you practiced billions of times. So this, when, when you apply this to a population, each one of us is one of those grains. All I can do is be a solid grain. And together, like a wave, like a wave, like a series of waves that's non-stop, non-stop, these civilizations, we will mimic the Germanic people and the Romans, and all those other people that survived the Romans collapse. When the Romans collapsed, they were the most hedonistic, pleasure-seeking. They would have meat in one hand, a prostitute next to him, sorry for the kids, and they would be watching slaves kill each other. Disgusting hedonism. Meanwhile, who survived the collapse of the Rome when the Germanic people came in and mopped these people up? You deserve to be mopped up sometimes. I personally, I'm not a big fan. I don't sympathize with the victim all the time. Sometimes you brought it up on yourself. Oh, what happened to the Iraq, the Mongols? Go look at them. They deserved it. Of course, they're Muslim. We have to have that respect. But look at the way they behave. Look at what they were doing. 
Of course you're going to be mopped up by the Mongols. The Crusaders, when you study what the Andalusian Muslims were doing, how they were living day in and day out, it's not just the emirs were corrupt. How were the emirs corrupt and the people good? It never happens, right? The people were bad. The people themselves were bad. When you read that, you say, they're lucky they got saved twice. They got saved by the Marabitun, then the Muahidun. You're lucky that happened. Thank Allah that happened, because you should have been mopped up way earlier. And when you got mopped up, and they pushed you down to Granada, then you went to Morocco, oh, that's a rahmah. Because the way you were behaving, you're not a victim. I don't have no sympathy. So, we are one of these grains. What was I saying before this? About to tell you something. We, each one of us is a grain. Oh, the Romans. Who survived the, when the Germanic people came and totally cremated the Romans? Who survived? There were people there, there were societies, sub-societies that survived. And the only thing in common, they had their own worldview. They lived differently from the Romans. They may have physically been there, they were physically there, but they lived differently from the Romans. Their everyday way of living, their beliefs, was different. So we have to be totally different. We, we need to be different. Sometimes they say, man, you guys are have some intolerance. Um, quality control is another way I would put it. You're intolerant of this, that, and the other. You call it intolerance. We call it quality control. You say, oh, what is your philosophy on apostates? What's your ruling on apostates in Islam? Blasphemy laws? Quality control. Highlight? Dewey. Apple, if you're old enough, this was a great company one day. And Steve Jobs put clearly why they were a great company. It's because of how much we say no to. We say no to little customizations that you could make. We say no to little details you put around. Make it clear, make it crisp. We said no to so many different little products that we could just put on the market. We end up with four products. A laptop, a computer, a phone, a tablet. Four products. That's how it began, right? An iPod. You can count the products. How many, Steve Jobs said, I'm so proud of how many things we said no to. It's called quality control. Next time someone brings you these things, oh, you reject so much, you're intolerant, you call it what you call it. It's quality control. We have a vision. We know what every grain of us should be like. It should be strong, sturdy, sound, keep it simple, and eliminate the garbage. If we all do this, we are, each one of us is a wave that's going to bring where we're going to be the ones who say in the night of Islam, we'll, we will see the course of history. This population rose up because of its very simple good habits by which we live. Very much looking forward to the Q&A session.